So welcome everyone to this month's uh, episode of Digging In with TPS and TSU. Uh, we're really excited for you to join us this afternoon as we talk about fads in history. Um, as always, as we get started, just a couple things to keep in mind. Um, we are recording this for inclusion on our TPS MTSU YouTube page, so please keep your mics muted. Um, also, if you, uh, if it's not showing up with your first and last name, if you would rename yourself. Um, and then our primary ways to make this session interactive, we will be using the chat function. Um, so if you would go ahead and open that, and if you've not already done so, please introduce yourselves. Um, we also have reaction buttons and we will be doing polling. Um, for those that may be watching the webinar later on on our YouTube channel, polling does not show up, but we will be reading those questions and answer choices aloud for you. Um, and also today, because we are a smaller group, uh, we may just have you guys um, unmute yourself and answer some of our questions too. Um, so, um, and as always, we do post um, all of our resources from each of our digging in um, sessions on our Padlet, which you can find at um, this address or using this QR code. So with that said, let's get started. I'm gonna turn things over to Stacy, um, who is going to talk to us a little bit about our theme for this month. Thank you, Kira. And I wanna warn everyone that my internet connection sometimes is real choppy at my house. So if you lose me, that's why. Um, I want to uh, introduce the theme, so I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully you can all see this latest edition of our newsletter. And um, so you're probably familiar with the format uh, and the kind of general types of materials that we include. And if you haven't been getting these, then you will uh, after this webinar. Um, so we chose fads in history partly because we are always at the end of our rope in terms of thinking of really cool new topics and we thought this would be interesting it's not something we've done before and um we also figured that maybe um maybe it would be something fun and lighthearted. but of course <laughs> We didn't pick, uh, we did pick some fun and lighthearted topics to cover, but not all of them are, unfortunately, but they all fit in terms of like what's the fad, what's a craze, um, um, what's something that was really popular for a little while in the past that seems very to understand why it was a craze bikes. Um, but I, I think that this is a good thing because your students are all, of course, going to be familiar with fads, uh, maybe from different decades, but it's good to get them to think about, okay, in the long run, what kinds of things are you into now that you think are going to be considered fads in the future? So, you know, what kinds of things are going to last? What kinds of things are real movements? What kinds of things are uh, just kind of spur of the moment, kind of zeitgeist of our current times? Um, and, and so separating what a fad is from what a larger historical development is might take a little bit of discussion. But anyway, so um, I, I hope that you can all see the awesome sorts of the month because it's about how ping pong watching can strain your eyeballs. And I think we all know that Zoom watching can certainly have the same effect. So maybe Zoom will one day be a fad or maybe it'll turn into a fact of life shudder to think anyway. Um, okay, and we also have a lesson idea on zoot suits, bloomers, minstrel shows, lawn tennis, uh, and some things on page four. And we're gonna get more, uh, just a quick kind of, what were you already familiar with before you even saw this issue of the newsletter? So Kira, if you wouldn't mind um, launching the poll, can, can I, do I have to give you the screen back? No, there it is. Okay. So those of you watching later can't see this, but those of you live with us now can see that um, which of these fads have you heard of before, as in before the newsletter? And you can answer as many as you want. So the bicycle fad of the 1890s, the ping pong fad of, of the early 20th century, 
the the fad of wearing bloomers in the second half of the 19th century on women 20th century um the minstrel shows particularly those with blackface uh, actors uh in the mid 19th century and then a uh, ragtime music fad of the early 1900s so we're waiting for a few more of you to vote it looks like no one had heard of the ping pong fad before, but everyone or most of you had heard of all of the others before. Um, all right, it seems like the, the most votes with uh, six out of seven go to the ragtime fad. Uh, and then you have bicycles, bloomers, zoot suits, and minstrel shows all tied for second place and no one voted for the famous ping pong fad of 1901 to 1903. All right, so uh, I'm going to close that poll. I, I think that's, I'll, I'll have to come back and show you a bit more of the ping pong fad than uh, when I do like a final look at resources at the end. But um, I would like to turn this to Kira because we're gonna do a deep dive as we usually do into one of our lesson ideas. And the one that we're gonna do a deep dive into for today is the one on minstrel shows, which is a fad that's thankfully a thing of the past, but it's very important for students to understand in terms of context for a lot of the, the, the racist stereotypes that are still around today. So, Kira, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back to you. Thank you, Stacy. All right, let me pull up my correct screen here. I wanted to not start with that one. Though. Let's go to the first one. All right. So for this, uh, for this newsletter this month, we decided to, uh, in looking at some of the different ones, we want to think about one of the fads in entertainment. Um, and of course, we know more recent fads in entertainment might be things like reality TV, um, remakes of classic 80s movies, um, you know, different things are happening within music, um, like, you know, the K-pop phenomenon right now. Um, you know, and sometimes fads can have long-term influences on popular culture, um, so they can shape uh, the, the future of performances in certain um, types of art. Um, they can shape uh, entire musical genres. Um, they definitely have influence on fashion. Um, and of course, can also shape stereotypes. Um, and so when we're thinking about minstrel shows um, as a fad, that's one of the things we want to think about is, you know, what they tell us about the time in which they were popular, but also what they tell us about their long-term influence. So before getting into this, um, you know, definitely you want to be very um, upfront with your students, possibly your administrators, and maybe even some of your parents. Um, the primary sources that you are looking at when talking about minstrel shows are very uh, offensive. Um, they are showing highly racialized characters of African Americans, they depict blackface, um, you know, and you want to be very cognizant um, of that and, you know, warn people. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we don't need to talk about them. Um, they are there um, in these archives for a reason, um, and they are really informative for helping us to understand the, the time period in which they were created. Uh, and again, also thinking about their long-term impacts. And it's important, though, to think about um, using context um, when using sources like this. So for this particular lesson plan, um, I used two sources uh, that I thought were great for providing context. Um, one was a blog article from the, um, the Smithsonian from the National African American uh, History and Culture Museum. Um, and the other one was an online exhibit, um, and I forgot to look back, I think it's University of South Florida who did this, um, but it's linked into the, uh, the lesson plan. Um, so both of these were really great for helping to provide some context for some of the sources that I found in the Library of Congress. Um, the other thing that you want to be very mindful of is giving time for your students to reflect on how they're feeling about the sources that they're seeing, um, and especially as they learn more about the context in which those sources were created. So definitely want to allow time for that. So 
When starting with, uh, you know, introducing students to menstrual shows, you're probably going to need to start at the very beginning. I figure most of our students don't really have a good idea of, of what even a menstrual show uh, was. Um, so just a, a brief background. These were first uh, developed in New York in the 1830s. Um, there were white performers who used burnt cork or shoe polish to blacken their faces, uh, and they were the, the primary performers. Um, oftentimes they wore um, tattered clothing um, and they mimicked enslaved people um, on southern plantations. Um, you often see them characterize, uh, the characters of their plays were characterized uh, Blacks as, as lazy, as ignorant, superstitious, hypersexual, or prone to thievery or cowardice. Um, and so that's kind of the typical character that you see in these minstrel shows. Um, and it was song and, and you know, song, singing and dancing. Um, by 1845, um, they had really gained popularity um, and in fact had launched an entire entertainment sub-industry at that point. Um, so, you know, when we think about these and, and where they get started, um, actually um, the image that we see here is of the gentleman who is sort of the one who started uh, minstrel shows. Um, so in the chat box, um, if you would, what are some things you guys notice about um, the image that we see here? His toes are sticking out of his shoes. Right, so we got these like ratty shoes where your, you know, his toe is literally like, you know, poking out. His clothes are patched. I do not even know what kind of shape that hat is. Right, um, yeah. But yeah, those are not the clothes of a rich person. Also, um, I, you know, unlike a lot of other images, these, his facial features are not exaggerated, which makes me think it's a white person with black mm -hmm. face, because if it were an African-American person, they, he'd have pretty ridiculously stretched out facial features. Right. What do you guys notice in the background there? What's up with the tiny house? It looks like a little hut, like right. a little conical hut. Right, which I think is really interesting because you see like sort of little palm trees in this little hut in the background. Uh, yeah, what's he? I don't see any grass. Is that like a sand dune? I don't get it. Yeah, yeah. So it's this really interesting kind of background to his, you know, representation of this character he's portraying here. All right, anything else? So I want you to keep this particular image in mind because we're going to compare it to something here in just a moment. So as I mentioned, um, that was the gentleman who uh, was the one who developed really uh, minstrel shows. Um, and Jim Crow was the character he was depicting there, and that was really the first a uh, widely popular character um, to be developed in minstrel shows. Um, and in fact, the image that we see here is actually the same guy um, as we saw previously, but in kind of this more um, racialized version of that character. Um, and so his name is Thomas, uh, Thomas Dartmouth Rice, um, and he is the father of minstrelsy. Um, he was born in New York in 1808 um, and worked as a traveling actor in the 1820s. Um, he was a gifted dancer and actor um, and grew up in an integrated uh, northern neighborhood. Um, and then he spent time in the South uh, traveling uh, while he was doing that acting in the 1820s. And so this experience gave him the opportunity to observe um, African American speech, song, and dance. Um, and he used, that op used those observations uh, and combined that with his own twist on humor and exaggeration to develop his first Black stage character, Jim Crow. Um, and so he would wear outfits like what we see pictured here, um, and he performed a dance to this new song that he wrote called Jump Jim Crow. Um, and he said that he learned the dance from an enslaved person. Um, so I want to, we're gonna come back and talk about the image here in just a moment, but I also want to play for you guys um, a, a, a rendering um, of that song. This isn't the exact you know, 1840s version, but it is a, a later version. Um, that's available from the Library of Congress. I hope if it will, okay. <laughs>
this is kind of a later version of the song. This is from 1966. Um, one thing that's noted here in the notes for this particular recording uh, is that the pace in this version is actually slower than what you would have typically heard of the minstrel shows, um, that likely that this version of it was used for like clogging and that kind of dancing. But still, I think it's helpful to give a sense of um, what, you know, those, um, what the song would have sounded like, um, and that would help your students to understand. So in thinking about the, the song and, and in this image here, what are some things that really kind of stand out to you guys? Well, people have already been commenting in the chat box about how his facial features are a lot more exaggerated um, than the previous one. And it, the, the background, uh, the setting looks different too. This looks a lot more like in the country. Uh, you can see the forests and the, they're like wooden, little wooden cabins and a, and a, and a split rail fence back there. Um, so maybe he's on a plantation. Uh, instead of at the beach or wherever he was before. But again, with the patched up clothes, um, of course, this is in color and they're very vivid colors at that. Um, is that a toe also sticking through the shoe? Yeah. Um, so yeah, and th the hat has a bit more shape. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Right. So, I mean, we can really start to see kind of this progression to how racialized the minstrel shows are, you know, as they are developing and becoming more popular. Um, so, like his music, um, Rice's dance combined Irish and African American styles. Um, and this was wildly popular with Northern audiences, um, as it was something that was, you know, completely new. Um, so while he, is, uh, he did this jig-like footwork uh, that marked the rhythm to the song, um, his arms and his hands followed the melody. Um, and as the extremely exaggerated and, stereoty and stereotyped Jim Crow character, um, Rice inspired really in a, a new genre of racialized song and dance, uh, minstrelsy, which was America's first unique artistic genre. Um, and so we see um, if you start looking through some of the song sheets and see some of the sources, you'll see that there are lots of, you know, versions really of, of Jim Crow that pops up. So here's when we have the Jim Crow Jubilee. Um, and again, we see kind of the same caricature um, of that character. Um, and now we see multiple kind of figures that are, are demonstrated there. Um, so how does this imagery in this song sheet here compare with the previous ones that we've seen? Well, he's the the dance the dance position actually looks very similar, but you see a lot more people in this one, um, and it makes me feel like uh, maybe this is supposed to look like a plantation scene. Um, you've got a bunch of people with um, curly hair. It you have this dance as a community spectacle. There are more musicians here. Um, these are, again, not people who look like they're of the wealthy class. Um, that's an interesting looking instrument that the performer is holding. And then is that, is that a weird looking hat in his other hand? Um, but he's on a stump of a tree. So that's, that's like, that's like as country as you can get in terms of a stage. Um, and then there's a dude in a chair at the top. And uh, is that supposed to be rice? Uh, somebody asked. So there's a lot going on here. It, and it, it really kind of reminds you of that stereotype of, oh, the slaves were happy on the plantation. And whenever we gave them free time, they just danced and sang because they were so happy. Right, yeah, so this really kind of plays into that. Um, you know, and it's really interesting because these were wildly popular again in the North and in the Midwest. Why do you think that they were so popular in those two areas of the country? Because they had no idea. I don't know. Um, well, no, it really is sort of that um, because I mean, really you think about it, who were the people who had the least understanding of the reality of life on a plantation? People, yeah. in, people in the Midwest. Yeah, um, and they could they could have their imaginations do whatever since they didn't have to face the realities of 
African American life at, on the same, you know, on the same level. Um, so kind of a, a blissful ignorance on on their part, and maybe a little bit of um, they got to feel all virtuous that they weren't uh, enslaving people anymore at that point. Um, and they and everybody, it was in everybody's interest to think that black people were content to be living like that. Um, I'm sure that meant a lot of Northern people, Northern white people were surprised when African Americans started moving North afterwards. Um, right. And so this also gets into thinking about how stereotypes work. It's really easy to stereotype a people when you aren't, you, you're not, you know, you don't see the reality of their living situation. And so when we think about kind of the stereotypes that are really running rampant in this genre of entertainment. Um, I think that that's another reason that is so popular is because they just, they weren't aware of the reality of, of daily life. So keep in mind that what we've been looking at right now, uh, up to now, has been imagery from minstrel shows from the you know, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. So this is all pre-Civil War. So that's kind of like one uh, kind of period within minstrel shows. Um, but then if we think about kind of how the genre um, adapts and changes um, in the late 1890s and into the 1900s, uh, we get to more imagery that looks like this. Um, and so by the late 1890s and 1900, um, African-American musicians and performers were shaping and influencing the genre, um, beginning with ragtime. Um, so white audiences really loved this, uh, this kind of new take on the music. Um, Ernest Hogan, um, who was the first black producer and performer in a Broadway show, developed a subgenre um, of ragtime called the coon song. Um, these songs used a rhythm common in obscure uh, backroom music halls and tapped into strong currents of racism. Um, the surge in racism in these songs was really an outgrowth of white fear about African-American migration from rural to urban areas that was happening during the time period, and especially migration that was happening coming into the North. Um, so if we keep in mind what's happening during this time period, of course, this is in the beginning years of the Great Migration. Um, coon songs tended to reinvent the stereotype of the antebellum zip coon um, as a black urban dweller whose primitive nature is both revealed and disguised by his fancified clothes and habits. And so this new version represented a backward black uh, who wanted to impress with ostentatious speech, dress, and jewelry. Um, the sheet music uh, from the time period often will see uh, imagery that portrays black men wearing top hats, tailcoats, and watches on chains. Um, Ragtime uh, made this character the most recognizable in American music by 1900. So looking at the imagery that we see here, um, how does that fit within kind of that context of the early 1900s, thinking about kind of the Great Migration um, and, you know, a little bit that we just talked about with kind of what was happening in ragtime music? Well, for one thing, this would be right after um, separate versus separate but equal and Plessy versus Ferguson. So we are now firmly in the beginnings of the Jim Crow being an established legal uh, status in the United States. Um, right. Um, yeah, so you have, you know, now we have essentially codified segregation uh, within our, our government. And it's, you know, part of a strategy of belittling uh, the things that you fear uh, or that or you're uncomfortable with, you know, so it's this kind of white psyche um, creating this. And uh, so showing more children on the cover might actually be kind of reminiscent of what you said about this kind of hypersexualization of of black people and also the way people treated black children more like they were adults uh, than than children right if we also think about during this time period of course you know early 1900s we have you know really um, a rise in, in racial violence that happens in those early decades um, we have you know increasing membership in the clan um, you know, there's a lot of different um, you know, activities that are really kind of getting into just um, how, you know, racism and, and racial violence is, is increasing in the country. And again, that's even representative here um, with what we see with the imagery, because they very much making, you know, we look at the one image here with uh, on the left, you know, the children um, 
honestly, they don't even really look human in some ways, um, the way that their, their features are so distorted. Um, and that kind of plays into like how it, you know, yeah, the dehumanization of people. So if we think about the imagery we see here in these posters versus the imagery that we saw in the other, um, what, how do those two compare to you guys? Well, in, um, in all of them, we see a bit of the idea of black people aspiring to be like white people and getting it horribly wrong, uh, which I guess is amusing to some people. Um, but these to me seem, these are, these are like, I can't even look at these. They're, they're so awful. I mean, so they just keep getting worse and worse. Uh, in terms of the, the the exaggeration of the depictions. Yeah, it's, it is in looking at these, and when I was looking through the sources to pick uh, what I was going to use for this lesson idea, it really did strike me that if you look at the, you know, the posters and the song covers from this time period, they are much more offensive than the earlier ones, which, again, aren't, the earlier ones aren't good. These are just that much worse. Um, so it, it's, it is really interesting to see kind of how that changed during this time period. Yeah, because so, I mean, obviously they, they just, they, not just the children, but the adults, they're completely dehumanized and they're, they look like, almost like animals, which, you know, this is also, we're getting close to the time of the, the Scopes trial, so that's, interesting. So in thinking about how you can use these with your students and again helping them to kind of place these into context and understand you know why um, why it's important to understand the context um, and what their long-term ramifications are you know we want them to think about again the racial attitudes that we that are representative from the time in which these things were created um, and what the, these sources can tell us about that. And then also to think about the long-term influences um, of minstrel shows in American popular culture. Um, the minstrel show really starts to kind of fade in popularity um, once we get to uh, like motion pictures and, and, and talkies. Um, although we do see characters um, still as we get into, you know, into kind of modern filmmaking that definitely play on those old stereotypes of characters from the minstrel show era. So again, that's where we see that kind of long-term impact. Um, and, you know, and you could have your students do some research and, and kind of find some examples of that that are or even representative um, and you know, we've seen in, in movies and such, you know, in the last, you know, 20, 30 years um, that they could find characters that are going to mimic those same stereotypes that we saw from the earlier uh, minstrel shows. So I wanted to end um, with this quote because I, in, in reading through the blog articles, I thought that this uh, quote really kind of sums up uh, nicely kind of again why it's so important to, to kind of understand uh, minstrel shows and kind of what they tell us. So historian Dale Cockrell once noted that poor and working class whites um, who felt squeezed politically, economically, and socially from the top, but also from the bottom, uh, invented minstrelsy as a way of expressing the oppression that marked being members of the majority, but outside of the white norm. Uh, minstrelsy, comedic performances of blackness by whites in exaggerated costumes and makeup cannot be separated fully from the racial derision and stereotyping at its core. By distorting the features and culture of African Americans, including their looks, language, dance, deportment, and character, white Americans were able to codify whiteness across class and geopolitical lines as its antithesis. Um, and so I, what I think, again, is really important about understanding, um, you know, minstrel shows and blackface and what this tells us about popular culture isn't anything that it tells us about African American culture. It really is what it tells us about uh, white culture at the time um, and their reactions um, to, um, you, know, you know, to white supremacy, to, to their own racial fears. Um, and so I think that really can help our students to kind of understand um, some of that mindset. Um, again, there are, um, you know, with this lesson idea, a link to a great online exhibit um, that has a lot of other additional information, and I would highly encourage you guys to look at that. And of course, the Library of Congress has a lot of other sources that kind of get into minstrel shows, um, and so this is a topic that you can find tons of sources on, um, and I would um, highly suggest looking at some of those. Um, and if the ones that I showed from kind of the ragtime era are too much for you, you can find a few um, that aren't quite as, as 
horribly offensive as those are. Um, so there are other options out there too. So with that, if there are questions, we'll take those. And if not, I'll stop uh, and we'll go ahead and turn this over to Layla. Well, um, I do want to just read a couple more comments from the chat box because people have been turning up a lot of good ideas uh, during this presentation. Um, one of them is this could, you know, when you're when you're talking about these kinds of things with students and the long term impacts uh, in terms of racial characterizations, um, it can better help students understand why certain things are offensive, uh, still offensive uh, today. Like there was a recent ad campaign where somebody used the word monkey uh, to talk about, I think, an African-American child. And that's just so unbelievably clueless. And, you know, this is why context matters. And, and, and people are not just snowflakes for being offended at something. Uh, there is like a longstanding tradition uh, behind a lot of these reactions. Um, another thing is um, that that quote that you just showed us on the PowerPoint slide was great. Um, and so the idea of establishing this cultural barrier between us versus them and how it really benefited the the more upper class white people to have poor white people invested in a race identity as opposed to you know poor people you know, forming more community ties with poor black people. Uh, so this is where race is used as a thing to prevent class being a thing, which happens all the time. Um, okay, so I just wanted to mention those. And one other thing too that I'll throw in before we turn over to Layla, um, as I was reading through some of this, it, we think about a cultural appropriation too. Um, so from the very beginning, again, Rice is taking, um, you know, songs and dance and things that he's seeing uh, from African Americans and, of course, kind of adapting those and changing those to create this character and create this genre in which he makes tons of money. Um, so he's benefiting from that financially. Um, and when we get into Ken the Ragtime, um, even the guy um, that I mentioned, uh, Hogan, you know, again, he's African American, he's, you know, pretty successful but he is still making a drop in the bucket to what you know the the white people who are controlling the industry what they are making um and again so again thinking about cultural appropriation who's benefiting financially for some of these is also a a, a, a take that you could look at this with uh, within all right so with that i'm going to turn things over to layla All right. Hi, guys. I think my big cup of coffee was a mistake. I'm a little jittery now. <laughs> but um, so today we're going to be kind of shifting gears here. Um, my name is Layla Smallwood and I'm a graduate research assistant with Teaching Will Primary Sources MTSU. I, it was a huge cup of coffee. I know. This is what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> So we're going to be doing something a little bit different today. Um, usually this is where we share our resources with you all. Um, like our highlighted resources from our newsletter. So we're not gonna share a bunch with you throughout the newsletter that we looked at. I'm actually gonna focus on one specific topic. Um, I, I thought this was a little weird at first, but as I got more into it, um, <laughs> I really started to enjoy it. So I'm gonna go and share my screen with you guys. Okay. So we are gonna be talking about Victorian morning culture um, and traditions. Um, so very interesting. This was actually one of our page fours. I'll show you in a moment on our September newsletter. Um, I'm sure a few eyebrows <laughs> kind of raised up when I said that this is what we're going to be talking about today, but just hang with us. Um, I think it'll be an interesting resource se session. So in the chat box for me, I want you guys to put it, what do you think of when someone mentions Victorian morning traditions or Victorian morning culture? What comes to mind in that chat box? Go ahead and type that in for me. uh right away somebody remembers the hair ornaments um, <laughs> yeah. not just the inclusion of hair but some stuff like jewelry made out of hair <laughs> yes i know we didn't uh, we didn't choose to highlight the more lighthearted fads i'm sure you all wanting to know more about ping pong but no nope, that's racism <laughs> bicycle culture didn't make the cut i'm sorry um oh and and this comes from queen victoria who Good. wore morning garb from the death of her husband till her own death, which was like decades. 
Mm -hmm. So she really kind of was the, the primary model for a lot of this. Good. And um, also they covered mirrors. It wasn't just the clothes and the jewelry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the house also went into mourning. We'll kind of get into that in a moment too. Good. Anything else? All right, cool. So we think of a lot of kind of different things when we think of Victorian morning, morning culture or morning traditions. And this picture um, on the left over here, these two images, it was actually used in our TPS MTSU newsletter, the page four that I'm going to be showing you in a moment. Um, this is a brooch, so an unidentified soldier in a Union uniform. It's a brooch with his picture in it. And then on the other um, side of the brooch, we have his hair. There's, like we said, a lot of Victorian hair art in this. Um, so yeah, um, lock of hair in the brooch. We're going to get into that. All right, guys, so the next image, this is an image from the Library of Congress as well. Um, so just kind of look at this image for a second. What do you think this chain is made out of that's on the image? Well, we're guessing hair. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are so good. You are on it today. <laughs> person yep. hair. Not like horse hair or anything, but like okay. person, yeah, the, did... the hair of that person. Oh God, I hope it's not the beard hair. <gasps> oh, that's too far. I hope not. If it, um, no. So yeah, so person hair, not like horse hair or something like that. Interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, you guys are right. This chain is um, made of <laughs> braided hair. <laughs> Kind of interesting. If you look very closely, you can kind of see the little hairs sticking out if you get close to the picture. I mean, this is from the Library of Congress as well from a collection I'm going to be sharing with you all in a moment. So this is titled Unidentified Soldier in Union Uniform with a Saber and Revolver in a Locket with a Chain of Braided Hair. Now that is a title. Um, so good. Hair art, like we mentioned just a moment ago, and the preservation of hair um, was actually another part of Victorian morning traditions. Um, I was actually listening to a podcast on this this week um, to prepare for this and found out that sometimes hair art pieces would be added. So like you'd have a piece of hair art and every time someone else died, that new lock of hair would get moved towards the middle of the portrait. And like the hair art would continue to like evolve in Victorian families as the time went on. So I did not know that. Um, good. Do we have anything in the chat box before I move on? We're just sharing our creeped out moments. That's all. <laughs> You're welcome. I hope hope you oh. don't put us in your nightmares tonight at yeah. your chain. We're, we're <laughs> noticing the coffee. Sorry, I offended you. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, so um, we also see that children have to oftentimes observe morning traditions. Sometimes they go into what's called half mourning, where they didn't have to be fully in morning dress. Um, so sometimes children who were younger, like 12 and under, were permitted to go into a half mourning for a lost, um, lost loved ones, like a parent or a sibling. Um, the picture on the, the left is of a young girl um, in mourning dress. This is from the Library of Congress. Um, she's actually holding a portrait of her father. Um, and this is Civil War era, so sometime between 61, 1861 and 1865 is when this picture is dated. But you can see a young child in mourning dress as well. Um, and on the right, this is kind of interesting. Um, this woman is in morning dress and she's actually in a local spot. Um, she is at Lookout Mountain, I guess a semi-local spot. Um, so this was also, the picture on the right was also used in our newsletter to kind of dive into morning dress and customs as well. Um, all of the images that I've shown you so far are from the Library of Congress and they are free and available to use. You can open these JPEGs, use these in your classroom. Um, I've also included a list of these sources at the end of the PowerPoint for you to go through and kind of use as you want as well. Do we have any questions? Hey, someone's wondering if um, maybe middle class African Americans would have been following these rituals as well. Um, we tend to think about white people, uh, European Americans, because of the Queen Victoria model, but um, I've never seen any examples from African Americans, but then maybe that's just because of the Eurocentric nature of the, the sources that I have seen. Um, yeah. And also, somebody else brought up the um, taking pictures of the dead, how that grows out of the development of photography in the midst of these mourning customs, and there's a really... <laughs> There's a really great British comedy show that just came out about that. Uh, if anyone wants to chat with me about it, yeah, I definitely recommend it. 
Yeah, and a lot of times I was doing some research and the pictures they have of somebody on like in death, those are the only pictures they have of that person or that child. So it's really interesting. I didn't see any pictures of um, African-American families in mourning dress, um, but I did see some families that were included in this collection. I don't know if they're necessarily in mourning dress or it's just like Union soldiers that are included in this. So I'm not quite sure there. Okay, let me go on. All right, guys, so over here on the right, I have our newsletter screenshot just to show you where it is, that page four. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead. Dr. Graham showed you the newsletter earlier. Can you all see my newsletter up right now? Okay, cool. So it's just this page four right here that I'm talking about, Victorian morning customs. So I wanna show you guys a video really quickly. It's like nine seconds. And in this video, I want you to just take a second, watch it, and then type in what you see. Do not bring in any outside knowledge, just what you see in the video. Okay. All right, I'll play it one more time. Just what you see, and as you're watching it, just type in the chat box what you see so far. We saw black drapery on the picture, which mm -hmm. somebody had mentioned earlier. Uh, so you can see it here. Um, you see black all over the mirror. Um, it looks like the mannequin who's supposed to represent a woman might even be wearing some sort of mask or veil. Um, Is that a, a place where a dead body would have been laid out? Uh, the red velvet thing? Um, there, but that's got like a, a veil. It's not a black one, but it's got a veil over that. Mm -hmm. And Some in the picture, there's a woman in a red dress. I mean, a black dress. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned that the mirrors would be covered up. This mirror above the mantle is covered up. Above the fireplace is covered up as well. Uh, um, yeah, and very Victorian with the wallpaper. This is a very like 19th century home in this situation. Um, good. So this is actually a clip from um, the National <laughs> Museum of Funeral History. I didn't even know that existed. But we're going to watch this one more time now and bring in what you know. So I'm going to play it for you one more time. So let me start it from the beginning. There we go. What do you know in the chat box about this picture? Well, for starters, this is from a wealthier family. Uh, it, I mean, you can just tell with all the fancy mm -hmm. furniture and drapery. Um, is the, the, we're thinking that the person who died is the person whose picture is draped with black. And okay. the draping of the mirror might have had some sort of paranormal symbol, symbolism of uh, not wanting the spirits to come through. So we're thinking it's a woman in mourning for her husband um, and their pictures are on the wall. Good. So in the last part of this um, with your students, you'd play it again and ask them what questions do you have? We've kind of already done that. We're like, who is this for? Is this a wealthy family possibly? It kind of makes me think of the hermitage when they go into mourning, um, the Andrew Jackson's hermitage when they go into mourning. It looks very similar in style to that. Um, good. So if you were doing this with students, you'd do that last step of questioning, but for time's sake, I won't do that to you all. Let me go here. Good, so that is um, just a quick clip from the um, National Museum of Funeral History. I've linked that in here as well, if you wanna go back and read some more information on that. And then the primary source analysis, we just did a brief primary source analysis and informal primary source analysis, but I've linked the um, primary source analysis form for you all, that way, if you wanna go back and look at that, you can. We have a PDF version that you can print and there's also a fillable version, which is really friendly for our virtual learning um, as well. So we always have to think about that now. Good, do you guys have any questions? <laughs> what, one person asked if that was a case for a Ouija board in the video. <laughs> Um, because the, actually the seances and kind of paranormal investigations were also uh, very popular as part of this kind of time, time in history, uh, same yeah. class of people too. Um, I don't, I don't know. You're going to have to watch the video and tell us. Watch yeah. I've linked it in here so you can always go back and kind of dissect it a little bit more. 
Cool. All right, guys. So um, I just wanted to end on these two images, very different, but also very similar. Um, on the left, we have Mary Todd Lincoln. And on um, the right, we have Queen Victoria. Um, so like we said, Queen Victoria is kind of who we associate with the whole Victorian mourning period. It's named after her. Um, both of these women are in mourning dress. Um, after her husband Albert's death, Queen Victoria is going to remain in mourning for him for the rest of her life. Like some of, somebody mentioned that earlier. So for decades, she's going to remain in mourning dress. Um, the picture on the right of Queen Victoria is actually taken decades after Albert's death. So she's still in mourning dress. This picture was taken in 1897. You see she has her black on under her lace. Um, so she's really going to influence mourning culture and traditions during the 19th century. The First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln on the left, she's also in mourning dress after the loss of her husband Abraham Lincoln, um, President Abraham Lincoln. And this shows how even women of the highest social statuses in America were being influenced by what's happening um, in the British Empire. They're being influenced by the royals over there. And I think that's a really interesting connection to make between world and U.S. history at this time. Um, both of these women are going to greatly influence both mourning traditions and styles um, of the time period. Any questions or comments before I go on? Okay, cool. So here are some of our resources I've linked for you. I just have our MTSU newsletter with all this information on there. I also have linked um, the Lillianquist um, family collection of Civil War photographs. That's where a lot of these pictures came from. Um, they're all free to use. It has more than 2,500 special portrait photographs and um, card photos for you to look through and use, both of Union and Confederate soldiers during the American Civil War. Um, so a lot of great resources to use there. I'm just gonna show you guys that really quickly. Here's the collection here, and you can see there are so many pieces in this collection. And they also have a teacher's guide with a set of selected portraits that you can use. And this has all of these portraits. There's the family that I was thinking of. Um, I know there are more African-American families in this collection that are pictured, but I don't know about morning dress specifically. Um, but they have all of these pictures here, and then they have a teacher's guide where you can have all of this information, suggestions for teachers, background, additional resources. So a great piece to use when teaching Victorian morning culture and morning culture during the Civil War, especially. Um, good. And then I just have our other resources from the Library of Congress here. And then I also have linked a few resources that are outside. So I have the National Museum of Funeral History, of course. The Museum of London, because they have a great article and exhibit about displaying Queen Victoria's morning dress. And then a few other pieces about morning culture and morning, uh, I guess, morning manners and traditions within 19th century um, society. So I guess that's all I have. Um, if you guys have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll get to them. Um, thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Graham. Thanks, Layla. Okay, so yeah, after death and racism, I think I should probably share with you some more lighthearted fads in history from our newsletter. Um, <laughs> besides the ping pong. Uh, one place where I actually found a ton of these things, and Layla did too, was within the Chronicling America collection. And I'm just gonna click under important links on just the first example uh, motorcycle uh, mania to kind of show you where I found all of these. So within the Chronicling America collection, there's this really, um, oh wait, I can't get back to it this way. Hmm. All right, pardon me. I'm going to get to it the old fashioned way to show you. Uh, from the uh, Chronicling America collection, there's a link to topics in Chronicling America where they've already pulled together a really a bunch of really cool um, sample newspaper articles about specific topics in history. And so from the collection homepage, you would just click on recommended topics over here in the left hand menu. And then that takes you to this page. Um, and I, uh, if you click on subject category, these are all the sub subject, sub-subjects, uh, and you can see that they actually have one on arts, uh, wait, crazes and culture, yeah, arts, education, culture, crazes, and trends. So this is where we kind of like ransacked to find a lot of those fads in history. So this is where the bicycle craze, this is where a lot of bloomers uh, articles are from, um, 
<laughs> believe it or not, yeah, yes, eugenics, I'm sorry, because we couldn't have everything uh, be totally lighthearted either. Uh, hypnotism, somebody was talking earlier about spiritualism. Look, Chris, there's one for the Ouija board uh, and its popularity during the same time period. Um, the teddy bear, which that still is, anyway. Uh, and so this is where we got a lot of those uh, that we filled up um, our important links box with. So that's where I also found ping pong. Um, and one thing I do want to mention also is um, there's a big connection between the bloomers lesson idea and our little page for blurb on the bicycle craze because bloomers originally um, emerged as something to go along with the the women's movement in the mid 19th century and was associated with women's suffrage. Um, but they had a comeback because of the bicycle craze for very obvious practical reasons that they were a lot easier to ride a bike in. Uh, so, so yeah, that's a case where you have a sporting fad and a fashion fad kind of working together. Um, so, all right. Another thing I wanted to point out is our featured feature uh, about, uh, yeah, we're talking about lawn tennis as a fad, but also pointing out these free to use and reuse sets that some of you who may have been on the Library of Congress website for years may not even know that they have this. But when you go on the Library of Congress's main page, at the bottom, if you scroll down far enough, they always have some sort of kind of primary source set just on whatever topic they pick for that time. They actually archive those. So you can go to, browsing the past sets and uh so there's one for independence day there's one on weddings horses veterans genealogy ice cream you know um not an ostrich i i haven't seen that one before um but so these are are really cool kind of um just kind of mini primary source sets maybe not correct uh maybe not tied to the curriculum directly, but still pretty um, fun. So, and then you just get like a gallery of different primary sources and they're free. So you don't have to worry about uh, things being in the public domain because they all are that are selected for this. So that's something that you can link to, uh, that you can get to through this link. Um, and the last thing I wanna leave you with uh, is uh, something that is fun uh, that maybe none of you have heard about before the skiffle craze. Maybe anyone heard about of, of what skiffle is? You know what skiffle is? Wayne's shaking his head. Yeah, skiffle um, was a type of music that developed in Britain in the 1950s. And it was a precursor in Britain to both rock and roll and the folk movement of the 1960s. And it was British musicians, uh, a lot of amateur ones, uh, as well as ones that were later professional, that were influenced by the folk music recordings that the Library of Congress was making in the United States. So like Alan Lomax and his father recording Lead Belly uh, and, and uh, other people like that. And these recordings were reaching across the pond and becoming popular there inspiring this kind of music called skiffle music that had a very short life. But um, a very popular performer now, one of my favorites, Billy, Bra um, Billy Bragg, uh, he actually wrote a book about it. And so here he is talking about it at the Library of Congress. And I'm gonna play for you um, a very short clip. Where is it? Did I go right past it? Where is it? Oh my goodness. It was there when I looked earlier today, I swear. Where is it? Um, well, now I'm totally disappointed. I don't get to play a clip for you from Lead Belly. Um, can anyone help me for a second? <laughs> uh, no. If I can find it. But it was it was there. It was there earlier today and, and now it's not. But the Library of Congress website has been having some problems today, so maybe it just deleted some things. 
So, alas, you'll just have to search for that on your own. Uh, <laughs> but it was basically a clip from Lead Belly singing Midnight Special. And I think a lot of you are already familiar with that song, Midnight Special. But yeah, it influenced this kind of moment in time uh, fad in British music that then turned into British rock and folk music that then came back to the United States and influenced rock and folk music there. So it's a really interesting back and forth there, like ping pong, like Chris said. All right, so I'm gonna turn it back over to Kira for final remarks and q and A. I was gonna say, wasn't that right down there where it said a recording of his talk was available? I could not see that, Wayne, on my screen. I'm. I do not know why, but yeah, it should have been like that. I, I do not know why I was not seeing that exact same thing. Now I'm going crazy. So Stacey, if you wanna look for it for a second um, while we do this up, maybe we can play it um, before we wrap up here. So just a quick reminder to folks, again, all of the materials that we have shared today will be on our Padlet. Um, we'll get those up there, including both of the PowerPoints that we shared. Um, so again, you can't access that there. Uh, and uh, we do hope that you will take a moment to fill out our post uh, survey. Um, and if we could, uh, we'll drop the link in there for you guys in the chat box here in just a second. Um, but that will give you a chance uh, again to uh, put in for your participation certificate. So if you would, please complete that for us. Uh, we want to thank you again for joining us for today's session. I'm going to stop our recording and then we will take questions. <laughs>